Hi, I'm John, the Let's Banking Systems Engineer, and I'm posting this video in Alex Jones, Infowars.com, Paul Revere video contest. If Johnny Engineer Termels to be the Paul Revere, I must bring warning of a mortal danger near and clear. This is it. So what's the greatest mortal danger we're facing right now? Fukushima. Nuclear fallout. 26 nuclear dumps in the United States with unsafe design that could take out the whole continent. So what are you going to do? Worry about terrorists, wars, when you've got 26 ticking time bombs like Fukushima with even bigger fuel dumps ready to leak and explode. That is the biggest mortal danger you're facing right now. So, why is nuclear fallout so much more danger than regular background radiation and x-rays and stuff like that? Well, the point is, sure, if that little piece of nuclear radiation, little piece of plutonium is a meter away on the ground there, it's only going to burn you so much. But if you bring it to within a centimeter of yourself, a hundred times closer, it's not a hundred times more damaging, it's a hundred squared, 10,000. Now, if one of these plutonium radioactive fallout particles gets in you, and Seattle got hit with 150 per person in April of Fukushima, 150. If one of these gets in you, well, if it gets near a micron, bumps into a bone, only one micron away, it's not a million times more damaging, it's a million squared. A trillion times more damaging. So that's why nuclear fallout that can get inside you is so much more dangerous than the background radiation they always compare it to. Now, think about how it happens. Just before the plume hit the West Coast from Fukushima. Um, Stephen Harper, our Prime Minister, turned off the nu nuclear fallout detectors. And that way he wouldn't have to warn people to keep, up, keep out of the nuclear rain. And baby deaths tripled in BC. So that's what they do when they can't solve it. They simply don't tell you about it. And instead of warning all the pregnant mothers to stay indoors, they just said nothing and suffered the consequences of triple the baby deaths. So the mortal danger is present and clear. And the flaw with the design in these reactors like Fukushima is this. In order to save money, instead of putting the fuel dump Spent, spent fuel dump pools in the ground or they'd have to you know, move stuff farther away. They went and put the fuel dump pools on top of the reactor. Now, this is not like a bomb with pounds of nuclear explosive be being blown around. This is tons of nuclear explosive being blown around. And they went and put their spent fuel pools right on top of their reactors. So if the reactor explodes, the spent fuel leaks and it explodes worse, 100 times worse. So that's the kind of situation we're facing in those Japanese reactors and 26 of them in the United States with the fuel, spent fuel sitting on top of the reactor. What bad news and no money to fix it. Now, Arnie Gunderson's videos, the nuclear engineer said, well, we could bury it all in three years, but we don't have the money. So, that's one shift probably, triple shift, we could probably bury it all in three years, one year. So, what are we going to do? How can it be done? I think I know a way of liberating a hundred million people on burying nuclear, and that's going to be the Argentine solution discussed in this video. So, what are my creds? Well, I remember Alex Jones, who was picketing the Bilderbergs in 2006 in Ottawa. I was there, too. And I and Mama Turmel, we picketed the Bilderbergs in 1995, when, oh, 2000, in 1995, when they went to King City, Ontario. And in 1983, Walter Tucker wrote that the Bilderbergs were coming to Chateau Montebello in Quebec, which gave me the tip-off to go picket them in the Quebec. And that's where I got to see David Rockefeller coming out of the Bilderberg meeting and a string of limousines and they were all stopped there and uh, I got a chance to pick at them and I could see him reading my sign 
Farm foreclosures equal more starvation. And then I flipped it over so he got to see bankers starve, third world babies. And you should have seen his jaw drop. So I guess David didn't forget that jaw dropping day when he met Johnny Engineer. So there are more things I've done anti-bank, but that's not really the fight. How did I get into this? Who do I think I am? Well, I am Canada's most court-accredited expert witness in the mathematics of gambling. After my degree in electrical engineering at Carleton University in Ottawa, I was the teaching assistant of Canada's only mathematics of gambling course for four years. During which I was one of the world's first card counters, junketing to Vegas, living the high life. In 1975, I ran the first card counting university team, you know, uh, though we didn't make the news like the later ones did at MIT and places. And uh, so basically, I could beat Blackjack and I wanted to run Blackjack back in Canada. And so what happened? I started getting games going and I started getting busted. And Geez, I got busted so many times, the media used to, used to joke that my jail cell at the Ottawa police station had a revolving door. So, anyway, I did want to, and I got tired of being busted, so I ran for Parliament to legalize gambling. Now, at that time, they asked me, well, what about inflation? I said, inflation? What do you mean inflation? Uh, you know, the inflation of the money. Well, I said, geez, the government's chips inflate. And my Cachino chips do not. What's going on? Hardware is identical. Inflation must be a software problem. How they go in and out. So I did an engineering analysis. And I came up with the explanation that interest doesn't fight inflation. Interest causes inflation. So as Canada's top expert in gambling, I wrote the book, Play Hold'em Poker Like a Bookie. I have the highest win rate for limit long odds hold them in the world. I was called an exceptionally prof a skilled professional gambler by the Ontario Court of Appeal. My opinion in the court tax case of Tony Eppel established that uh, casual gambling winnings are not taxable in Canada even though my professional winnings are. And I ran the biggest casino underground game ever busted in history, 28 table casino termel in the Ontario Provincial Police's Project Robin Hood, where I made a million bucks. And I had to spend it before they took it away, and that comes into the story later. So, here I am, the only engineer I know of specialized in gambling and in computers, and what I see is killing our planet is a computerized mort gage, mort meaning death, and gage meaning gamble, Mort Gage in the computers, so I saw it as my duty as an engineer sworn to uphold the best technology possible to take on the malfunctioning banking system. So in that way, I launched six different applications in the Supreme Court of Canada to restrict the bank's computers to a pure service charge and abolish the interest charge to make money run like poker chips with no inflation and enough chips for everybody to get into the game. Now, everybody's heard of Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, John the Engineer, right? I'm John the Engineer too. So Rand's John the Engineer, the Atlas Shrugged, who ran away. Atlas Shrugged not is John the Engineer, who chose to stay. So now, if you appreciate the mortal threat we're in, and the only thing that can save us is to find a way of funding, decommissioning, and cleaning up of nuclear and other infrastructure repairs. Well, then the next hour is going to be on the advanced engineering mathematics of the banking system reduced to simple algebra you should be able to stay with. So this is important. Listen to it. And at the later juncture, we'll tell you about the Argentine solution and how you can end up with an account in a big PayPal in the sky where instead of pledging Visa, you got to borrow for, you can put up a hundred hours of labor, pay off all your interest bearing debts, and after that all payments go against principal. Doesn't that sound nice? So here's the math behind why you should have an interest-free online time-based PayPal account. 
Hello, I'm Johnny Engineer, the only banking systems engineer on the planet. And with the banking system crashing everywhere, maybe you'd like to know what the only banking systems engineer on the planet would do. I would do what they did in Argentina. In 2001, you know, the banking system crashed. You probably heard about it. Did you hear that in 2006, they paid off all their IMF World Bank debt? They went from broke in 2001 with the bank shutting their doors and people not being able to get their money, which has been predicted is going to happen in the United States too. And five years later, all IMF World Bank debt paid off two years early. How'd they do that? We should do the same thing. We can do the same thing. So I'm going to give you a little lesson in banking systems engineering. Not too hard to understand. You have to understand that I first ran in politics to legalize gambling. I was known as the great Canadian gambler. I was a teaching assistant of the mathematics of gambling course at Carleton University for four years after my degree in electrical engineering. And I've been a professional gambler for the past 35 years, which has paid for my politics and my missions. And uh, I ran for parliament to legalize gambling. And they asked me, hey, tell us about inflation. I said, hey, my casino bank has chips, different colors and denominations, and the government's bank has currency, different colors and denominations. So I said, how come this one suffers inflation and this one doesn't? The hardware is identical. Inflation must be a software problem. So I did an engineering analysis. It's been published, known as Bank Math. It's at my website, johntermel.com slash bankmath.htm, and it explains how I can make my poker chips inflate, and once you learn how to make chips that used to not inflate start inflating, you can also learn how to stop money from inflating. So here's a little lesson in banking systems engineering. Where does money come from? The inner workings of the banking system are mysterious to many, but no matter how complex, it can be reduced to having the money plates. Whether they be plates for changing metal into coins, plates for changing paper into notes, or plates inside a bank's computer changing electrical blips into bank deposits on which checks may be written. Since changes in the money supply are regularly reported in the media, money must enter the supply from a source and leave through a sink. Our liquidity system has both a tap and a drain. The easiest way to model our system of financial liquidity is with plumbing. All banking systems have the same exterior connections to the economy, which you can think of as the pool where people splash around with their funds. You have figure two, which is the interior of a piggy bank, reservoir system. It shows that a deposit is first made into the reservoir, and a loan is then taken out of the reservoir, which causes no increase in the money supply. Conversely, when a loan is paid, it goes into the reservoir and there's no decrease in the money supply. Though the Bank of Canada operates a small tap and adds a small amount of high-powered money to the money supply, about 2%, I searched the Parliamentary Library in Canada years ago and found a quote from 1939 by Graham Towers, Governor of the Bank of Canada, pointing out that quote, the banks do not lend out the money of their depositors. Each and every time a bank makes a loan, new bank credit is created. New deposits. Brand new money. Unquote. Say what? Figure 3 is the interior plumbing of a chartered bank, which shows that it has a tap and is not the pure reservoir system like the piggy bank model. The loans do not come out of the savings reservoir, but they come out of the tap of new money, like a casino bank, not a piggy bank. When a chartered bank makes a loan, the amount of money in circulation goes up. When a loan is repaid, it goes down the drain. In the textbook Economics by Lipsy Sparks Steiner, it states, quote, the banking system as a whole can create deposit money, unquote. Therefore, the banks have all their very own tap, their very own set of electronic money plates. How banks conceal their creation of money. 
The injection of new money from their taps has been well hidden from the public view because the Bank Act insists that before any new money may be loaned into circulation, old money must be deposited into the reservoir. It's as if a casino were to insist on old chips being put into the safety deposit section before it would issue new chips. By merely matching new loans to deposits, this brilliant cover for the turning on of the tap misleads observers into falsely concluding that a chartered bank operates like a piggy bank. With a lawful reason to seek deposits before they can lend, there is no outward difference between a chartered bank and a piggy bank. Yet banks do not seek deposits to lend to other people. They seek them to lawfully turn on the tap of new money, leaving depositors old deposits in their accounts. It's a fascinatingly tricky mechanism, but its purpose is to foster the impression that borrowers are getting savers' deposits and that savers therefore deserve to get interest for lending borrowers their money. This may surely have been true when banking did operate like a piggy bank without the creation of new money, but it certainly is not now true that banks operate more like a casino bank issuing new liquidity. The matching of loans to deposits successfully hides the fact that no one is giving up the current use of their money since it is new money being loaned out and therefore no one is being deprived of the use of their money. The problem is that the bank's reserve ratio forces a limit on how much they can lend out. Let's say someone deposits a hundred dollars in savings to the reservoir. They're allowed to lend out ninety new dollars out of the tap, letting the money supply go up ninety dollars. That ninety dollars goes up to the pool and eventually finds its way into a savings deposit for someone else. And when that ninety hits a reservoir in a bank, they're allowed to turn on their tap and let out eighty-one new dollars. And when that $81 circulates around and lands in a savings account back in a reservoir or in a bank, they're allowed to lend out 72 new dollars. And that goes on and on and on and on until they end up lending out a complete new $900 based on the $100 with a 10% reserve ratio. With a 5% reserve ratio, they could turn that over and over and over and actually create $1,900 with that $100. This is the second big lie of economics, and you can catch any economist by simply asking them, hey, when I get a loan from a bank, where'd that money come from? And they'll always say, from their depositors' funds. And you say, yeah, but doesn't the reserve ratio and the multiplier effect say that they're lending out brand new money? And they go, that's right, without realizing that the money can't be coming out of the reservoir and coming out of the tap at the same time. It has to be one or the other. And, of course, Graham Towers said that it was coming out of the tap. So, that is how they do that. Now, obviously, when you make a payment on your principal, they destroy that money. And the amount of money in supply goes down. So, when a large withdrawal is made, for instance, or a large failure is written off in the bank's books, the amount in the reservoir goes down. And the reverse reserve ratio takes place. Since losses are covered from the reserves, when that happens, they have to subtract money from the economy and call in their loans. It's quite an automatic doomsday mechanism. It was bankers calling in loans which precipitated the 1929 stock market crash. As people fail to meet their call and those loans are written off, again reducing bank reserves, more loans must again be automatically called in and credit cut off. The process gets worse and worse and causes the banking system to fail. Any cabal of rich men can precipitate such a credit crunch by simply moving their savings to another country, which forces the banks in the target country to start calling in loans. Such private power over the world's financial system is inappropriate. So now you know that the second big lie of economics is that bankers do not lend out their depositors' funds. Each and every time a bank makes a loan, new bank credits are created. Now, it gets worse when they start charging interest, and that's going to come up in the next example. But just remember, banks do not operate like piggy banks. They operate like casino banks with a limit, depending on how many chips are deposited in the safety deposit section, which limits how much they can lend out of new chips. A pretty stupid limit on your ability to lend out new chips if people have collateral. Interest, next lesson.
Hello, I'm Johnny Engineer, and today's third lesson is going to be some poetry from my poem bank.htm, which you can find at johntermel.com. So, this is going to be a recap of yesterday's lesson, how bankers create our money, how money works, how can a substance man creates be kept in short supply, why is there insufficient for our industry to ply, where does our money come from, has an answer known by few. The source and sink are hidden from an ordinary view. Our governments do not create the money that they use. All governments are deep in debt. We need some other clues. The media do tell us when the supply of money grows, but very, very few do ask ourselves and wonder, where's the hose? Supply of money must come down. We hear it constantly. But where's the drain? Is contemplated so infrequently. The banking of liquidity is understood by few, but there must be a tap and drain which money must go through. The engineers are plumbers called, the nickname they have earned. Mechanics of the flows of fluids are what we have learned. Comparison of models is the engineering test. Is exponential faulty <clears throat> and is linear the best? A bank of poker chips that works like coins when some do play a linear banking system for comparison today. Transaction made with colored chips to help in keeping score, backed up with our collateral, <clears throat> it's one to one, no chore. In poker games we see that chips are traded in and out. Redemption of collateral is what it's all about. Inflation means that what we get for money is somehow lost. They say it's unavoidable, we all must bear the cost. Yet value of the poker chips is constant over time. A mere receipt for assets where there's no accounting crime. Since hardwares are identical, both round and colored too, and one did lose its value while the other counted true, inflation therefore can't be hardware which works flawlessly. Inflation therefore must be software programmed crookedly. The bank ads reinforce with Billy and its piggy bank the notion that the loans they make are from the savings tank. The operation's simple and most everybody knows. A dollar in, a dollar out is how the system goes. A piggy bank is simple and we've all tried out a few. A money reservoir to save which grows by one and two. Banks are not like piggy banks. It's known by very few. The banks are more like poker banks with chips that are brand new. The issuance of currency is hidden from the slate. A rule to have deposits first was made law by the state. A limit set on money's volume, artificially. It's not on wealth, but on our savings, supplementary. A hundred dollars to reserves are saved by you or me. Now ninety brand new dollars may be loaned out stringently. The ninety dollars does return and is deposited, so loans of eighty-one new dollars may be submitted. Depositing new money liberates a fraction more, but less and less until you find you hit a finite score. So now you know how banks create money. Well, back in 1993, after I had made a million dollars running my underground gambling casino, and they busted me and I had to spend it before they could take it away, I founded a political party, the Abolitionist Party, the Anti-Slavery Party, and you say, whoa, there's no slavery around anymore. Well, they might have gotten rid of the metal chains, but they haven't gotten rid of the debt chains, and we're here to finish the job. So we're the abolitionists after the debt chains. But anyway, I ran for parliament, had 80 candidates, uh, one more than the Greens, my chance to run for prime minister. And at the time, they had a show on much music called Talk Me to Your Leader. And they had a Canadian musical icon interview all the people who were running as party leaders. And I got to be interviewed by Randy Bachman, where I explained how the Let's Interest-Free Barter system would work. But I wrote a special poem for that night, and I did it on national TV with Randy, so I'm going to do it again here to explain the injustice of having private banks running our money plates and creating our money for us, especially now that we know how they've hidden it. They're not lending us depositors savings for which we should pay interest. They're lending us new money and they're charging us interest. They don't deserve it. So I call this poem Having the Plates. When you were little, did you ever dream of printing cash, filling up your wallet with some money in a flash? Creating money accurately means to have the plates. The stamping of some paper into notes best demonstrates. Or stamping metal into coins. Or 
blips computerized into your bank account deposits. Checks now authorized. So whether paper, metal, volts of electricity, to have the plates is printing money absolutely free. Now, if you printed it to spend, the others would be whale. They'd call it counterfeiting and they'd send you off to jail. But what if government would let you print it out to lend with only what you can collect in interest to spend? If you can print and lend a thousand, hundred, a thousand out at 10%, you'd make 100 interest on printing that you lent. But if you could print up and lend a million out, you'd get an extra $100,000 for your fee on debt. If government stops using its own plates and comes to you, a billion printed nets, a hundred million revenue, with everybody being taxed to pay you interest of all the scams in history to have the plates as best. Though never spending, only lending. Riches do await to all who with the plates become loan sharks to the state. And though to join the few who thusly profit you might dream, wake up to see we're all the victims of this greedy scheme. Though governments of old had treasury run money plates without the interest of middlemen at rip-off rates, most governments today to banking industry have lost control of money plates, so interest is now a cost. To service debt in 99, Canada's request, $320 billion taxed for interest. We're taxed almost $1,000 each per month to pay for interest to holders of our plates they gave away. So we abolitionists, we want to get the plates back from the banks and have Treasury create the money for only a printing charge and thanks. The interest we save, the thousand a month, would be split up, I recommend, for each to get a thousand dollars monthly dividend. As if you owned a share in the incorporated state, an income guaranteed for life, no question, no debate. So, right now, Governments are lifting interest in taxes off all the people, and without changing anything at all in the tax structure, the government structure, all I'd like to do is get the plates back from the private banks so that government doesn't go borrow from them and tax me to pay them interest. And that $1,000 a month that's hitting them with the Brinks trucks every month, once we get the plates back, we intercept the Brinks truck with our interest in it and give it back to ourselves as a dividend. So do you understand where your thousand dollar dividend would come from? It's the G note they're now lifting off you to pay taxes to the guys they gave the license to manufacture money to. And if we had treasury did it, we wouldn't have to pay that interest. So would you agree control of money plates by private banks should end? with all that interest diverted to your thousand dollar monthly dividend? Well, if you understand where your genome would be coming from, because it's now being ripped off, and you want to have it back, you have to find a way to get an account at the Bank of Canada or the U.S. Treasury, anything but having to deal with the middlemen loan shark banks. I'm John, the anti-poverty systems engineer, and that's another lesson on how the banks shouldn't be allowed to create the new money and loan shark it out. Lesson number four next, how interest really makes it aggravated in the game for all the borrowers. Hello, I'm John, the engineer, Google for Bank Fighter Extraordinaire, and today's lesson is going to be on banking systems engineering called the big lie of economics. We're going to derive the miracle equation which explains how they're scamming you and keeping you poor. Now, the uh, all economics is based on the big lie which says that raising interest rates fights inflation. My miracle equation proves that raising interest rates causes inflation and that's what we're going to figure out today. Now, Mortgage comes from the French, Latin, mort, meaning death, and gage, meaning gamble. And here's what happens. Everybody borrows 10, and they all promise to bring back 11. But the bankers only printed 10. So Keynes likened it to musical chairs, where at the end of the game, everybody knows that someone's going to be left out and will get knocked out of the game. 
Well, that's how the mortgage death gamble works in finance, too. So now we're going to go over the der derivation of the very simple equation. Here it is. Bankers create the money supply when they make loans. So looking at the third column, the algebra, you'll see that producers are forced to gamble by borrowing the newly created principal to pay for their production costs, P, and then inflating their prices to recuperate both the principal and the non-created interest, P plus I, from their sales. Because total goods priced at P plus I can never be sold when consumers only have P dollars available, a minimum amount of goods must remain unsold, and a minimum number of producers must fail and suffer foreclosure. So, the production costs are P. The production prices, equal to the debt, is P plus I. The purchasable value, the survivors, is P over P plus I. And the unpurchasable portion is I over P plus I, which some media have called Termel's Miracle Equation because it explains how many guys get knocked out of the game, how much employment will be generated by that particular interest rate or death rate. Here's a little game to demonstrate the death gamble to your friends. Get them all to put up their watch as collateral, say five friends. Lend them all a hundred matchsticks or a hundred chips or a hundred marbles. Doesn't matter what the medium is, you're going to demonstrate the inflation and the unemployment you're going to create. But lend them all a hundred, taking a look at the first column. And then say at the end of the game, you're going to have to all pay me back a buck and a quarter, 125. All five of you. So now, in the economy, what producers do is they borrow the principal, then they use their money to produce goods, which they're going to sell. So in this case, I'd go up to the friends and I'd say, okay, now, here's the economic token for food. I want you to now use your money to buy it and spend it and invest it in creating that food token you're now going to put up for sale. To the second person, here's a fuel token, which you are going to are going to try and put up for sale. But now spend your 10 into the economy, and now you've got a fuel token. And everybody spends their 10 into the economic pool, and they all receive a product they're going to put on their shelves and try and sell. So basically, everybody borrowed 10, spent it to produce. Everybody inflated their prices to 11, because that's the minimum debt for the price tags on the shelves, and now it's up to the economy to decide who's going to sell and who won't in this game of musical chairs. So I use the flip of a coin as a fair gamble to model this thing. And if it was a large pool of people with hundreds of people playing the game, I would say, okay, everybody who's in the fuel business, flip a coin. All right, all the winners come forward. You've sold your stuff. Put in your token in the pool and take out your 11. Then I would have everybody who offers clothing flip and see who the economy chooses. And all the guys who win, come on, put in your token and take out 11. And through this, you would eventually knock half the people out then do it again and do it again. Until at the end of the game, you're going to find out that only 9 guys out of 10 can come up with 11 tokens. Then the economic pool runs empty. And the 10th guy gets squeezed out of his death gamble more gosh. And that is what happens in the economy. All businesses borrow the principal, new money, to pay for their production. And then they all inflate their prices to principal plus interest. And then they all try and recoup the 125. And at the end of the game, four of your friends have a hundred and a quarter and their watch is back. And your fifth friend gets knocked out of the game. That's how it works on Interest Island. Now we have to explain how it would work on no interest island, on service charge only island. Now in this case, we'll use a bank of same bank, matchsticks, except everybody now puts up their watch as collateral and they all borrow 11 or 110 matchsticks. Now, everybody immediately pays me, the banker, my 10 out of the matchsticks that were created. So I got paid. And then they use the same 10 they produced their goods with last time on Interest Island, and they spend it to produce their goods. Except now, when they try and recuperate 110, all of them, not only is the original principal in circulation, but my banker's C is in circulation so that I can buy it too, and they can recuperate the whole 11 and settle all their debt and be ready to start over next year. 
So that's the difference between how interest works and how pure service charge works. Recap. A contract bearing interest, a mortgage is its name, can be translated from the French to see the total game. The word for mort is death, which is a clue we all should heed. The word for gage is gamble and a deadly bet indeed. The mortgage is the plight of all. Death gamble it does maim. The debt is always bigger than the money in the game. Game theory. The chips can be inflated too and lose some equity. Just charge a little interest and plainly you will see. If ten of you all pledge your watch to borrow ten chips each, eleven chips is due from all, a mortgage all can't reach. One hundred chips is all you have for principal you got, but no more chips for interest. Those chips were given not. The principal is P. The debt has grown to P plus I. The debt has grown with interest, so some of you will die. The number of survivors is P over P plus I. The ratio of losers is I over P plus I. This shows I over P plus I is debt you cannot sate. The confiscation of your watches happens at this rate. Less watches backing up the chips drives value down for sure. We have induced inflation in poker chips that were once so pure. The number of people knocked into foreclosure is the number of people who have their collateral confiscated. Though we are led to believe that inflation is caused by an increase in money chasing the goods, shift A, actually it's caused by a decrease in the collateral backing up the money, shift B, due to foreclosures. Though both inflation shifts feel the same, the miracle equation shows inflation is not the inverse function of the interest rate, it is the direct function of the interest rate, exposing the big lie that interest fights inflation. Every economist in the world has been taught that inflation is shift A. No economics curriculum mentions the other possibility, shift B. This is not accidental. But when most people who have not been conditioned by economic studies are asked whether prices will go up or down when interest rates are raised, they're quick to agree that a merchant must pass on increased interest costs by raising prices. And yet very few notice that this logical conclusion, that interest is passed on in higher prices, is in direct contradiction to the big lie, which is repeated over and over in all our media and economics textbooks, that interest will fight inflation. So, though we're told that interest does fight inflation true, I say that is the biggest lie if others only knew. The number of you seized upon goes up with interest. Inflation that results is clearly seen with simple test. You're told inflation's volume of the money on the rise. Inflation's really loss of assets, that I emphasize. Inflation isn't too much cast to chase what we produced. By seizures, money chases stock of merchandise reduced. And though more money or less goods are shifts that feel the same, the seizure of collaterals, the shift we have to blame. So by the use of interest, the money does inflate, and by its abolition, money can be steady state. So almost all monetary reformers get the inflation shift wrong, and they will never come to the solution that more money can pay off the excess debt, because they think more money will cause inflation. Shift A. Ron Paul loved the man, but he's a dinosaur when it comes to money. There should not be any worry about too much money when the problem is too much foreclosed collateral. So, that's the big lie of economics explained by Johnny Engineer Termel's Miracle Equation. Hi, I'm Johnny Engineer Termel, and today, Easter 2009, as we think about Jesus Christ who took that big sacrifice and beating up the bankers in a temple, and three days later the King of the Jews was on a cross with a Roman inscription, condemned to death, though I believe he did survive it and escape, a real coup against the Roman Empire, that's another story, hard to prove, but more likely than the stories we get about a resurrection to explain why he was seen alive. So anyway, on this date, we're going to talk about Jesus' most often cited words, which are repeated seven times in the scriptures. And amazingly enough, they are the differential equation for interest rates. 
what he perceived to be the problem afflicting civilization then, and I agree, afflicts our civilization now. So, Easter Sunday for Jesus, his seven times quoted message got through. Christ's seven time quoted definition for usury, interest on money. In Matthew 13, 10, the disciples came to him and asked, from the New International Version of the Bible, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In Luke 8.10, he repeats, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that, though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more, Whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken from him. Now this reason he speaks to them in riddles, so only those who have the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God's heaven and hell will understand that this is a differential equation. I found it repeated seven times in scripture. Again in the parable of the talents, Matthew 25, 29. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Again, in the parable of the Minas, Luke 19, 26, I tell you that to everyone who has will be given more, but as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. Again, in Thomas 91 of the Nag Hammadi Scrolls, just discovered in 1948 in the desert, Whoever has something in hand will receive more, and whoever has nothing will be deprived of even the little he has. And finally, in the Apocalypse of Peter 7, 3, chapter 83, uh, verse 27 of the Nag Hammadi Scrolls, Everyone who has, it will be given to him, and he will have plenty. But he who does not have, it will be taken from him, and be added to the one who has. So, an input, a deposit, or a borrowing, balance to a control system with a Laplace transform of 1 over S minus I, where I is the interest, for a differential equation, dB over dt is equal to IB, so the rate of bank balance change over the rate of time change is interest times the balance, where B is the balance, of course, has an output where everyone who has will become more positive, and everyone who has not will become more negative, like a bank account. Now, I had not used the Nag Hammadi verses in my poem bank.htm at my website, johntermel.com, but I've just added it. So here's some of the poetry on these verses. Jesus' most cited verses, which are the differential equation for usury. In Matthew chapter 13, 10, it tells where he was asked, Why did he speak in parables? So meanings they were masked. The reason for disguise of message, note the words he said, it all comes down to interest. The theme affects the head. To those who have abundance will be given even more from those without abundance will be taken from their store. This mathematical equation states the function best. This biblical description of the function interest. To those with spare, the positives, they'll get some extra perks. And those with none, they'll have to pay. That's how the system works. The rich get richer, poor get poorer. It's not brotherhood. It's obvious that interest is reverse Robin Hood. This rule of more abundance was repeated down the line in Matthew 13, 12 and 25, verse 29. In Luke 19, verse 26, with 8, 18 as well. In Mark 4, 25, five times Christ used these words for hell. The new stuff. In Thomas 41 from Nag Hammadi Scrolls, a new Apocalypse of Peter 83 272. So, what to do with an abundance of spare seeds? Well, that goes on. So, Paul to the Corinthians 2, chapter 8, 14, we find abundance matched to need with charity foreseen. Quote, 
your own abundance now should be supplying for their need that their abundance later will supply you your own seed and in this way who gathers much will not have overfill and he who gathers little will be taken care of still and in this way there soon will be a rich equality where people help each other with great productivity Finally, omitted from the Bible, but in Gnostic text is found, the greatest of all Christian laws for economics sound. St. Thomas in verse 95, where Jesus said it best, If you have money, do not lend it out at interest, but rather give it to one from whom you won't get it back. Thus helping out the poorest saves us from financial lack. So Jesus Christ came to the planet to fight debts, not sins. The Our Father originally said, Give us the, today tomorrow's bread and forgive us all our debts as we forgive our debtors. And they corrupted it into give us today today's bread and forgive us our sins. Jesus didn't say forgive us our sins. Ezekiel said God told them if we do change our path and do right, all our sins will be forgotten. So Jesus wouldn't have said, ask for forgiveness of sins when it's been promised. Jesus asked for forgiveness of debts. He said, when you're not chasing anybody for debts and no one's chasing you for debts and you got tomorrow's bread, call that heaven. Well, on Easter 2009, the day in honor when Jesus probably escaped Roman justice and survived the crucifixion, I would bet, because I believe he was really seen alive later, I honor him and his message, and it's been received. The most often quoted words in from Jesus in the sacred texts are the differential equation for interest, the flaw that's afflicting all of our civilization, and the eradication and abolition of which Jesus prognosticated, said we should do. That was his prescription. Thank you, Jesus. Glad to think of you. Easter 2009. Satan's usury or God's dividend? Your choice. Jesus said that heaven is just like hell, except no loan shirking. In the Our Father, he says, let it be done the Father's will on earth as it is in heaven. So, how is money run in heaven? In the parable of the talents, he says the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he describes where a loan shark makes everybody pay 100% interest. One servant gives him back his principal, stiffs him for his interest, gets thumped out, thrown in the alley where men weep and gnash their teeth. And in the parable of the minas, again, the master wants his interest and the <clears throat> servant gives him his principal, <clears throat> stiffs him for his interest, and the master says, slay him in front of me, because in the old days, if you lost your death gamble, they could take you and make you work you to death in a galley in two years, or they could send you to a gold mine and work you to death in six months. So why would Jesus say that the kingdom of heaven is like the kingdom of the loan shark? Because it is. Get rid of the loan sharking and this planet's a heaven. It's only the loan sharking and the debts that are harassing mankind. I wrote a poem in my Bible poem, What Heaven Is. If you were to be asked what for you would be heavenly, there'd be no executions and no alleys, certainly. There would be lots of food and drink some clothing and a home, a razor and some shaving cream, a toothbrush and a comb. If you had also trappings of a great technology, all the tools and gadgets that use electricity, communications, education, entertainment, wealth, a staff of competent physicians watching over health, most labor that is tedious is done by robots who release you to explore the universe God made for you. Still, you have to pay for it in heaven. Because Isaiah 55 said, he specifies, the way to answer when you hear the sound of needy cries. All you who have no money and are hungry still may come and buy the food we have so that you may eat your fill. And you who have no money and clad insufficiently do come and buy some clothing so that warmly dressed you'll be. Obviously, lending is no problem and collecting is no problem. It's only the usury that turns heaven into a hell. So, what would happen on the day of jubilation when the Father's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven? 
Well, Jesus said in that day, no one's going to be chasing you for debts. You're not going to be chasing anybody for debts. You're going to have tomorrow's food. And that's easily done by being able to open an account at in Canada, the Bank of Canada's computer, or at the United Nations, the Unilet's computer, whatever, open up a Time Bank account, cut checks to settle all your interest bearing debts and your mortgages and anybody you ever owed and everybody you had to stiff and you'd like to settle up. You start cutting all these checks and get one stable number. And after that, all payments to the sugar daddy bank in the sky go against principle. And eventually, someday, you're going to get out of debt. But you'll also start getting payments in your account emailed to you by many people who had to stiff you, rob you, whatever reason, so that there'll be a general cancellation. Now, if you go to YouTube videos at my channel, King of the Poppers, and you look for Argentina two years early, it'll explain how when people have a lot of interest-free money in their pockets and they can't get interest at the bank, what do they do with it? Well, they pay off all their debts right away. And there's a general cancellation of internal debt, which frees up all federal currency to pay off external debts, which is how Argentina paid off their IMF World Bank external debt two years early. The key was a lot of community currency in circulation that nullified all the internal debt. So what would happen? Well, unions would immediately be able to pool the credit lines of their employees and buy all the shares in their corporations. And the rich people, with the owners, would be paid, get their value in money that's going to be stable. And the producers are going to be the ones who are going to profit from their enterprise. No more parasites collecting ownership fees. So, that's the basic perfect blend of capitalism and communism when everybody gets to be a capitalist because everybody's got a credit card to get in the game and pool their resources in that way. The marketplace has been explained. You, you want a job, all you have to do is log on, look at the e-marketplace where they're offering all sorts of jobs at different rates per hour. The minimum is a child hour of labor and everything else is multiplied accordingly. And just like Boy Scouts, the more things you qualify for, the more hours per hour you can earn. So that most young men would in their youth get their firefighting badges and be able to help out in a fire anywhere or a forest fire anyway when called on. And if they happen to be working in a restaurant that time when the forest fire hits, someone else will leave whatever they're doing and move into that slot because they're qualified while he goes off to fight the forest fire for a couple of weeks. So a very efficient pooling of manpower. Now, it also eliminates the gamble. You got our my buddy, not so quick Herbie, and he decided he was going to make some uh, two-tone lime and pink wingtip shoes. And so he puts his hat on the net and says, I want to make two-tone lime and pink wingtip shoes. Anybody want some? No response. So he doesn't take a losing death gamble by borrowing, spending to produce, inflating his price and losing. Instead, he says, somebody says, hey, change it to black and white. Maybe some old timers will like that. So he, it's not so quick. Herbie puts in two-tone black and white shoes and pretty soon he's got bzz, 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 800 orders. Now he can go to the credit system and say, I want this much leather, this much paint, this much that because I got a market up front. No more losing death gambles, only winning gambles. So that's an easy way for everybody to be able to participate once the e-market is here. And the more badges you get, well, the more you earn per hour. And the best thing of all is that right now, probably 80% of humanity is involved in wasted, useless things. And only 20% actually build and do things. So that, let's say all the poor people, the victims in the 80%, in some countries, 50, 60% unemployed. And then you got all the prosecutors and all the caregivers for all those victims out there. There may be with judges and police and to keep them down, there could be 80% of the population who are wasting your time in poverty and idleness and controlling poverty and imposing poverty and 20% of the people working. Imagine now that all these people doing the useless stuff don't have anybody to chase because who's going to do a crime when you've got an interest-free credit card and a chance to go grab all sorts of jobs? So that all of that wasted enterprise and insurance companies, all these people can go home, stay there, 
pick a course, retrain, get into something useful. So what if we can divert mankind from 20% useful power and 80% in the wrong direction or wasted into 100% useful power in controlling and improving things? Well, if you look at the Zeitgeist Addendum movie, they point out how the energy, the clean energy is available could have us all living in energy wealth. And the only thing lacking is the money to finance clean energy because cheap, dirty stuff is all we can afford because we're short of money. Well, you would have wind, uh, solar, tidal, all these different energies possible if we could afford them. And now, without 80% of humanity wasting your time doing nothing useful, we can afford to all throw in an extra hour to make sure we have clean energy. And we can de decommission nuclear, which is stupid because it's so dangerous. We just don't need something this dirty and dangerous around when we can have perfectly clean and especially if we now cut back. We're not shipping our tomatoes overseas. They're not shipping their tomatoes here. And we're not not trying to export our surpluses of steel there. They're not shipping their surplus steel here. That insane competition of death gamble to try and export what the home market can't buy ends. So all that wasted energy now doesn't get wasted anymore. So with everybody cutting back, no more going to work, all these judges and lawyers and people who do nothing. You judges can become referees at badminton games or whatever, but it's going to be a whole new world when everyone's got a chance to do something useful and get paid properly for it. The difference is we want to ask you to take God's dividend instead of Satan's usury. Right now, most people are protesting and picketing for and striking for more money for their food. When they could be striking for more food for their money. Now, that takes a paradigm shift to understand, but some kid comes up to you and you knit him a sweater, or you produce a sweater, and, he's, and you charge him a one-hour bill for the sweater. 30 years later, you come back to the kid and you say, hey kid, here's your one-hour bill, I won't give me my sweater back now. He says, guess what, sir, I got better technology. Here's three sweaters for your hour. So, with an interest-free money, your money will start to buy you more and more stuff as technology gets better, which is logical. I call this God's dividend. Now, you can choose Satan's usury. I want more money for my food. I'm going to strike for more money for my food. Instead of God's dividend, I want more food for my money. And that's what's going to happen when we stabilize and get rid of usury. Over time, your hour is going to buy you more and more stuff. So instead of hoping that you're going to get more money to retire with, you're going to find that your money keeps buying you more and more and it gets depleted less and less so that everybody does end up pretty rich. So without the usury going to the loan sharks who don't need it, there's enough to go around and keep us all in comfortable wealth. And that's the beauty of the Zeitgeist Addendum movie, as it explains how the Federal Reserve Banking System is dragging our industrial entrepreneurship down and they do point out there's only the principal and not the principal plus the interest but if they didn't do the final derivation of the miracle equation that I over people aside get knocked out into unemployment and foreclosure and shift B inflation so they're almost there and when they do millions will now decide hey let's give up on Satan's usury and let's accept God's dividend and that's the answer to mankind's salvation so what are you gonna do Hello, I'm John Turmel, King of the Paupers, working 30 years to try and set the debt slaves free. Now, if you Google for losingest politician, I come up. I've run in 68 elections trying to get interest-free credit cards for the poor. But also, if you Google for great Canadian gambler, Taj professor, poker systems engineer, you find out I'm the best limit hold'em poker player in the world. Also, the losingest politician. Well, I have more favorite names that I've been called. I've been called Anti-Poverty Engineer, Atlas Who Didn't Shrug, if you Google, Spartacus at Babylon, the real Spartacus in Rome went after Rome's army. I would have gone after Rome's creditors in Babylon. You can get me if you Google for Prime Minister of the Planet, King of the Fringe, Richest Pauper. And it's with the Richest Pauper that I decided to write to Bill Gates, the world's richest man, because in the year that I got into the Guinness Book of Records, 1997, Bill Gates was in there too. So, here is the richest pauper's prayer to the world's richest man. October 15th.
to world's richest man, Bill Gates, from world's richest pauper, John Turmel. Hello, Bill Gates, world's richest man, a Guinness claim to fame. I'm John Turmel, world's richest pauper. Politics, my game. The Arizona Republic called me the world's richest pauper. The engineer, the gambler, 48 elections clear in 1999 as abolitionist, let's, banking systems engineer. Blackjack King, casino tsar, Robin Hood, millionaire, guerrilla lawyer, best bank fighter extraordinaire. The great Canadian character anthology says best, the motive for my pauper's 20 year, now 30, persistent quest. As Dr. Walter Schneider, math of gambling prof can swear, he went from apolitical to running everywhere. One day his interest in interest existed not, next day its abolition was his motivating thought. The poppers seen some high school buddies choose to quit the game. You two the man have buddies I would bet checked out the same. No loan shark, richest man, earned gains were making tools I use, Microsoft. You should concur with Rich's Popper's engineering views. In Nehemiah 5, he says, you must do as we do. So stop exacting interest. It is the big taboo. St. Thomas 95 is verse where Jesus said it best. If you have money, do not lend it out at interest. Another great prophet, Muhammad, known in Muslim lands, decreed that it was sinful if one interest demands. No mortgage interest a native shouldered life with ease, but their death gamble, poverty, was fatal their disease. Ralph Nader's found the banks today, unsafe at any speed, and has endorsed let's time dollar banks, safe for every need. I penned some verses on how let's could end Queen's poverty, but palace staff were little help, no high-tech whiz had she. Yet let's, in British Parliament, here's MPs voicing yes, no tax for trading time with neighbors, U.S. IRS. Australia says lifeboat lets, cushions community. Great Britain's hails lets anti-poverty. Lets being the local employment trading system, software which lets you trade employment locally and now internationally. I've marched with Jubilee 2000, though they are ill-aimed. Forgiving poorest debt is alms, no panacea claimed. But White House, IMF, World Bank saw Popper's placard best. That banks starve third world babies, so abolish interest. With interest switched off in bankers' debt machinery, those former chains of debt become mere straps born easily. So Pope, reformers, Jubilee 2000 date is near, yet Ecuador's not poor enough to qualify this year. Debt cancellation, Tobin tax, they're splashing in the pool. The problem's in the money pump house, interest the tool. The vast solution takes all money errant pumps in hand. It's not a half vast splashing in the money pool that's planned. Relief could reach the whole wide world to ancient strife placate. Imagine Earth as Eden with no feedback causing hate. The Christians and the Muslims and the Nazis and the Jews are in agreement. Let's conforms to everybody's views. The richest man must also tire of a game gone mad. But you have power to switch off the feedback that is bad. An online let's by Microsoft to shop with hours we trade with global lifelines reaching all and money local made. We'd gladly pay our service charges, cash or green amounts, if you'll be veins and arteries to link our let's accounts. Millennium, let's jubilee, give world-class gift you can, if you grant just pauper's prayer to the richest man. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Christ taught us how to pray. So every day till year 2000, here is what I'll say. Our Father who in heaven art, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come when let's be done, on earth as heaven the same. Give us now our daily bread, forgive us all our debts, as we forgive our debtors all their debts with this new let's. And to temptation lead us not, no debt which suffocates. Let's jubilee 2000 from our Santa Billy Gates. Amen with the engineers. P.S. 2008, nine years later. A decade's almost gone. Bill's opportunity was lost. For failure to use might, 
a billion, quarter billion souls the cost. Bill studied the inequity as business problems same. World's richest man's club 5% give peace of win and gain. For Bill, social reform is rich, donating to the poor. It's just more of the same. It's alms. His riches are the lure. He could have been a hero to the starving masses, rare. Instead, his role has been a mere, no difference, billionaire. So, Argentina in 2001 went broke. And they did something. And five years later, they paid off all their IMF World Bank debt. You didn't hear about it, but it's out there. How did they do it? We wanted. So I announced I was running not only in my 68th election in Guelph, Ontario this year, where I only got 40, 58 votes, 58 people who voted for an interest-free credit card, but I also announced that I was running for Prime Minister of the Planet. Everybody knows that. I ran for Mayor of Ottawa. I ran for Premier of Ontario in 1981 with my Social Credit Party. I ran for Prime Minister of Canada in 1993 with my Abolitionist Party. One candidate more than the Greens. And everybody knows that there's an election for Prime Minister of the Planet. Who's going to be the first candidate? Well, Google for Prime Minister of the Planet, and I'm the only name who comes up right now. All right, so what could I do about it? Well, I could keep running in elections and talking about how we should restrict the bank's computers to a service charge like poker chips and abolish the interest rates that causes all the problems. And now, 33 years later, after 77 elections and 76 losses, and one called off, I'm in the Guinness Book of Records as the world's biggest loser. At two, legal, well, since I had been charged so many times with gambling offenses, I had only used the lawyer once, first time when broke, decided I'm not going to do that again. I learned how to use the courts and defend myself. So in the 1980s, when I started the fight against uh, bank foreclosures, listen, if a criminal can stall, 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 going to jail by appealing, 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 why can't a poor person stall, stall, stall foreclosure by appealing, appealing, appealing? So I came up with stiff the bank kits, which allowed people to stiff the bank and for the interest, not the principal, and stall their foreclosures for up to 33 months, my longest stiff. Though they were eventually thrown out, they got to live 33 months rent-free and get ready for the eventual bad day, as opposed to being evicted broke. So that was the legal angle, and of course asking the courts regularly to restrict the bank's computers to a service charge, six motions of which reached the Supreme Court. They said no. And uh, finally, well, there's direct action. Let's face it. I kept protesting. I kept picketing. I picketed the Bank of Canada for five years. I was at the Denver protest in 97, 98, Birmingham, UK, 99, Cologne, Paris, Washington, Philadelphia, the battle in Seattle demonstrations, Jubilee 2000, except I was there and my sign said, abolish interest on debt, not abolish debt because nothing wrong with honest debt it's only the debt for stuff you didn't get you got to be mad about and that's only the interest and of course i then protested at the millennium assembly in new york in 2000 when the whole anti-globalization demon stood down all those people and let me be the lone activist at the millennium assembly right there and you can see my picture just above Bill Clinton's picture as the lone anti-debt activist in the New York Millennium Assembly of greatest world leaders on the planet. Now, more story about that later. I mean, I was at Quebec City, G7, G8, G20. I picketed the Queen, Charles, Diana, Reagan, Gorbachev, the Pope. So everybody saw my abolish interest rate signs. And that's direct action. But there's an even better direct action economic action. The first political poem I ever wrote was, why represent our collateral with dirt chips for a fee when we can represent our collateral with our chips for free? So, in 1981, I started a Turmel social credit computer, which allowed people to log on and barter their time, but it was too small, and I really couldn't devote much time to it. And in 1984, I heard about a LET system developed by Michael Linton in British Columbia, local employment training system. And I checked, you know, no interest, green dollars, basic poker chips, allows people to swap their labor with an alternative medium exchange. 
So I financed the first time bank software ever written by Michael Winton. And then it went on to spread around the world, which later got me invited to the United Nations to do a speech on banking. But that basically had to do with my running the biggest casino, making the million dollars, running for prime minister, which got me invited to the UN. And then I got invited to do the speech on banking because of, they knew about let's and they passed the uni let's resolution. Cute, eh? So now we're going to step to the Argentine solution. And this is the video that won the Occupy Wall Street Silver Bullet Award the Argentine solution, and then we'll play one little clip of what my politicking is like when I go up to people and say, would you work for government bonds you can use to pay for taxes, hydro, medical, and licenses? Hi, I'm Johnny Engineer Termel, and I'm wearing my Mountain Hours t-shirt because my video, Argentine solution, is Occupy Silver Bullet. For my own prophecy, won the video contest. Now, $500 prize. Thank you very much. Wayne Walton, who runs the Mountain Hours. And his contest was called The Solution to Defeat the New World Order Debt Star. And I, mine was titled my three-minute video, Argentine Solution has Occupy Silver Bullet for my own prophecy. So, here it is again. Just to let you know what, it's only three minutes, but it explains how we can use a system that Argentina used, that Russia used. I'll tell you about that later, and we can all use it too. Hi, I'm Johnny Engineer Termel, and the silver bullet for the Occupy movement is the Argentine solution, which can fix the planet before next Christmas in fulfillment of the Mayan prophecy for the better. Dubbed the bank fighter extraordinaire, here I am being arrested at the IMF World Bank Conference in Toronto in 1982 when I was all alone. When you look around at the world, you have to admit it's pretty scary. We have a police state being set up all around us. It's as if there's a big slavery system oppressing us and there seems to be no way out. If you YouTube for Prime Minister of the Planet, I'm the only declared candidate. How dare I? Well, I was the teaching assistant of Canada's only mathematics of gambling course. In the United States, I was known as the professor at the Taj Mahal in Atlantic City. I'm the great Canadian gambler. And if there's anybody who can show you how to win, it's me. Even though I'm in the Guinness Book of Records for losing more elections than anyone else in history. So, what makes the biggest winner the biggest loser? A fixed game. I'm a protest instructor with a solution to offer as opposed to a protest obstructor who has nothing to do but tear down the fence. At the G20, cops stood out of the line to shake my hand. In 1983, I was allowed into the Queen's receiving line with a picket sign. What could have been my solution? Well, the Argentine solution, back in 2001, they were broke. By 2006, all foreign debt paid off. How'd they do that? The unions told the government, you're not going to lay us off. We'll accept small denomination provincial bonds in our pay that we can use to pay for our hydropower, taxes, medical, and licenses, HTML. All the people in the provinces took the bonds as currency. They laid nobody off, hired more people, all debt paid off in five years. We can do it too. In 1999, I traveled 11 European countries and paid for 39 nights out of 40 with an IOU for a night back in Canada, denominated in hours. You can too. In 2000, I was invited to the United Nations to do the speech on banking, where they passed the Unilets Time Bank Resolution. Someday you'll be able to pay your debts with time. So what are the chances the Occupy Movement's going to pick up the Argentine solution? Well, when it comes to fixing mammon, Jesus said they'll forever be hearing without hearing and seeing without seeing or understanding. And all we have to do is accept each other's bonds denominated in time between countries and we've created the perfect new money to save our planet. Dennis Kucinich's bill, which would have the Treasury take over the Fed and run the money system interest-free, and no one's supporting it. British bookmakers William Hill offered me a million to one odds on my bet that the Mayan prophecy would be done by next Christmas. So let's prove them wrong. So lend unto others as you would have them lend unto you. Interest free. So the back of the t-shirt reads, Mountain Hours are Summit County's new local currency which is issued interest free based on time. 
This is the organic solution to the globalist tyranny which has enslaved the world in impossible debt. Patriotic Americans of the Occupy and Tea Party movements have spoken. There's a problem. We have a solution which does not rely on another corrupt election or uh, more phony saviors. Free, responsible people must take action to be the change in the world. Interest-based money creation and lending are the problem. One cannot pay P plus I, principal plus interest, when only P exists. Summit County, Colorado has the solution. We will have more money, lending, and banking without interest. Mountain Hours, 970-817-5881, Wayne Walton's organization. And here are a couple of hours, a Wayne Walton uh, Mountain couple of hour bills. So if I ever go down there, I'll have some of my uh, accommodations covered. Anyway, should the Argentine solution, and we could call it the Russian solution, because a couple of articles have just come out recently, I'll do a whole video when I read these, that point out that in Russia, when the banking system crashed, local governments were authorized to issue their own local currencies to pay their workers with, just like the bonds in Argentina, and they had... 750 republics and cities issuing their own chips and about 25,000 enterprises. We have Canadian Tire money in Canada, Shell dollars. Well, just imagine 25,000 different businesses paying their employees with chips that you can buy their product with value. So anyway, if the Argentine-Russian solution can go viral, a solution to pay the unemployed who are in the streets screaming for jobs. Screaming for jobs is not as smart as screaming for paychecks if you can tell them where the paycheck should be coming from. Tell them you'll take provincial bonds or government currencies to do work for your governments. Tell them you're ready to work if they'll simply give you some government paper without any interest on it. Johnny Engineer Turmel running for Prime Minister of the Planet on the Argentine Solution, and the world can be fixed by Christmas in fulfillment of the Mayan prophecy, where this hell of a planet becomes a hell of heaven of a planet, rather than most people who think this hell of a planet's going to get worse. Here I am outside the uh, Natural Birthing Clinic in Brantford, where they're going to be talking about not enough money, no doubt. So I'm going to go find out how many of them would take tax credit bonds that they can uh, use like in Argentina. If we actually had a system whereby we had an alternative currency, yeah. like the Kingston Hours or the Ithaca Hours, that right. was actually functional yeah. and you could use for real services, yeah. I think we could really revolutionize our economy. Hello, my dear. You run this clinic? I totally And what's actually, your name, please? I'm Kathy Penzak. Okay. Susan actually runs the clinic. She's All right. our office administrator. <laughs> would you take a short minute to just tell me a little bit right away from your point of view, what's important here? Uh, the, the main point we are trying to get across is that uh, we want midwives to be paid uh, at the level they should be paid at compared to other professionals. Um, and we're not. We're All right. Now, did you ever hear what the Argentines did when they ran out of money? In, t in 1980s, what they did was the union said, you're not going to lay us off. You're going to pay us with small denomination provincial bonds. Now, if we printed $10 provincial bonds that you can use for hydro, for taxes, for health care, for fees, would you take an increase in provincial bonds, if nothing else? Yes. All right. Thank you very much, my dear. Boy, did I have high hopes when that won the Occupy Wall Street movement and there was activity all around the world thinking that, wow, the Occupy movement might pick this up and pass it on to the unions and everybody will be demanding how to be paid, not to be paid, how to be paid in bonds. And basically, I had bet, and I did bet, the British bookie, William Hill, gave me a million to one odds on a bet that I said the world would be fixed by Christmas in time to fulfill the Mayan prophecy. Nice of them. Oh, yeah, I lost my bet, but the point is, it can still happen soon. So... The Argentine solution has a lot of history. It's not the first time this has happened where governments use their own chips interest-free instead of using bankster money and taxing us to pay them interest. So, a little bit of history here. 
In the olden days, thousands of years ago, the temples used to issue receipts for grain on clay tablets, you know, and that was their money. Pound of grain, move that around. They could have done eggs, they could have done anything until the goldsmiths showed up and screwed up their money. But, for instance, Sparta used to have clay tablets, and everybody who showed up in Sparta dropped off their gold, and they used clay chips in town. Just like at a casino. And what the casino Sparta do with the gold they loaned sharked it out to Athens, the suckers who were still not printing their own chips. Rome's Republic, I has grab copper money. There it is. Another government issuing their own chips, usable by payment of taxes, is when they had their great empire. So, of course, there was King Henry's tallies, and that was the smartest, most brilliant, uncounterfeitable money ever created. He took a stick, he split it in two, like a ticket, bam, and this was the tally, and this was the due. Okay, this he held on, and at the end of the year, he counted up how much he spent in the upkeep of the realm, and said, that's a tax, everybody, and they better tally up with the stubs. So that's how interest-free government money works. They print it, spend it, tax it back, no interest, King Henry's tallies, just like tickets and stubs. So after that, we have in North America, the great Iroquois civilization who had wampum beads worth a horse. Hey, crazy foot's bead worth a horse was an honor to have on your wampum belt, rich man, you know. So that was a great interest-free system. But as soon as the white man showed up and talked him into using gold, they ended up on the same unemployment line together. And, of course, then American Revolution. They tell you it was over a tax for tea. It wasn't. Ben Franklin says we used to use our own provincial state Pennsylvania currency had everybody at work and when they banned our provincial currency and we had sudden unemployment and misery that's the real reason for our revolution and then they used continentals interest free money again and it was working fine and it won the war but it was debased by counterfeiting which can happen but without counterfeiting it works fine don't need to pay interest to banks to make your money good finally Abe Lincoln's treasury notes, which were really Buchanan's notes from the administration before it was President Buchanan who first issued 30 million in U.S. treasury notes and saved all that interest, and Abe just issued 10, 15 times more. So he got credit for it, but Buchanan did it first. And then finally, recently, while well, Kennedy wanted to issue silver certificates, but he was shot and that was stopped. And then finally, U.S. Greenback notes, well, they were used by Lincoln, of course. And in the 20th century, the only example was national, was Hitler's labor notes. Did you notice that during the Great Depression, Germany had 100% employment and were building stuff and cars and roads and stuff, while the rest of the world were in the depths of the Great Depression? How do you do that? He had a time-based currency. Put everybody to work. And then he spent it on war machinery instead of tractors. But let's go on to that later. So basically, now, during the Depression, bad times. They were, well, let's go back to other depressions. When the Argentine system crashed in the 1980s, these six provinces started issuing their own provincial bonds. And inflation went from 1,000% down to you know, 30%. And then once things were better, they put away their own currency and got back in line with the loan sharks. And by 2001, they were broke again. So once again, they started to issue bond currencies, but this time they've also got a big barter network. Seven million people issuing their currencies at the same time so that a farmer's IOU for a ton of grain was accepted by the big corporations. The more grain he grew, the more grain money he could spend. And, of course, that filtered through the economy, and that was the result of the great paying off of the debt from 2001 broke to 2006 all paid off. Now, what's interesting is, between those two Argentine solutions, Russia had their crash. And this didn't make the news until last year when an article came out and the history of local currencies in Russia. And it said that during the Russian crash, there was the appearance of self-minted currency, their own chips, in 750 republics. 750 bond books. And cities in the Russian Federation, as well as of about 25,000 enterprises, 
McDonald's rubles, Ford rubles, GM rubles, Monsanto rubles, even Walmart rubles. Understand how it worked? As long as the guy signed it, it was still illegal to make a copy of it. So, and that worked fine, didn't make the news. So the Argentine solution worked in Russia too, except that they worked it from both angles, top down, states issuing their own interest-free currencies, and bottom up, corporations issuing theirs. I just want to add people too, get it? We're all good. So there it is, Russian local currencies. But in the article, the second article I found, it said, after the Russian Revolution in the country, there were always shortages of money. They were forced to overcome by printing banknote surrogates, local currency. 1920, the flowering of ersatz money, uh, not quite real money. They're printed cities, factories, communities, institutions. Money substitutes were banned only in 1935. Now, in the United States during the Great Depression, they had up to 2,000 local currencies going to help the broke people provide a medium exchange to people who had none. And then FDR also banned those local currencies. Now, at the end of the Depression, there were 7 million less people on the census than there should have been if everything stayed normal. And I would bet that when Stalin banned the only local media of exchange they had, that that aggravated the Great Depression in Russia too. And all the while, here's Hitler in Germany with everybody at work being paid with labor bucks. Isn't that wild? So that's a sad story about that. Now, what's really best is Portugal has just announced that they're going to pay their employees with treasury bills, okay? But only months, one month's worth. Now, if they were smart, they'd pay them with 12 months worth. They say, we're gonna save a billion dollars. Well, why don't you save 12 by giving them 12 months worth of government money instead of bank money? So Portugal's on the right angle. Now, that's the national and the smaller local, but now let's talk about what's going on in the private world. This is the big changes. Bottom up, I call it. Let systems, time banking. What's happening out there? Well, the biggest revolution happened in Kenya with the M-Pesa mobile wallet revolution. Okay? Where now people who don't have any bank accounts because they don't have any assets, but they all got a cell phone now. And they can put their paycheck directly into their cell phone and then they can transfer those cell phone minutes around. So... M-Pesa mobile wallet revolution. Is it a phone or is it a bank? It's a bank that works with a phone. Your own bank, interest-free. Now, that means that the banksters in Kenya get no interest on any of those transactions. You get it? Now, wherever these are spreading to, wherever let's go, wherever time banking hits, Wherever someone uses an alternate medium of exchange, the bankers get no interest. Which is why the first world banks are crashing because they're losing all their third world business to these underground media of exchange. Example, Nigeria. Now their PAGA system, they're starting up. 18 phone companies want to do the same as Kenya. Gee, they only got 2 million new members in one month. God, in the West, you'll get... 20 members in a month and you'll be happy in a let system or a time dollar or something small. 2 million members in a month in Nigeria. Oh, and PESA arrives in India. Isn't that neat? They're going to be able to transfer their cell phone minutes in India too. Hey, how come we can't transfer our cell phone minutes over in America or Canada? Why not? We still got collateral the banks want to seize. Oh, Google is thinking of setting up an M-Pesa time trading with your text uh, messages machine. But they always screw up, so I don't count much on them. So, finally, neat machine in Japan, the Furiya Kipu. And they are basically a health time bank system. There it is. Japanese nursing and welfare system. So that... The majority of the population can put in care for neighbors and get those hours registered and then call on them later and transfer them around. Get it? 
So, we want that too. The Furiyu Kipu, and that explains why Japan has taken their trauma in with such ease. And finally, the neatest one. China's virtual currency threatens the yuan. That is the QQ currency. They got 800 million people on their Facebook, and their Facebook started up their own Facebook chips that you can use to pay for all sorts of stuff, so much so that all sorts of businesses started taking it too. And every time the underground medium of exchange is used, the banks get no interest. You see what's coming down? So don't worry about the banks and the, your country running out of money. There's plenty of time money once you get on. So, and there it is, the QQ and the history at Wikipedia. So there bottom is the bottom-up solution that's happening right now. If you should be so lucky to live in a country where the, your, your telephone is going to allow you to text your minutes around, you're saved. Get it? And no more vig to the bankers. So. Finally, now if I should win Alex Jones's best video contest for the Paul Revere message to save us from the imminent and present danger of nuclear catastrophes, well, I will help finance and set up a time bank system for his guys because in 1999 I traveled 39 nights out of 40 paid with an IOU for a night back in Canada. Now, why couldn't all of Alex's supporters be using Alex's juiceless Jonesy Jack, a word for coins, and keep track and exchange accommodations? Within a couple of weeks, you'd have a half a million rooms listed around the country, and none of you Jones supporters would ever have to pay for a motel again, probably. So, I did it. It's happening around the world now, but you could organize within your own country almost overnight. And I'll help if this video wins. Set up your bottom-up solution. Juiceless Jonesy's Jacks. Yes, sir, those are the coins we want to use. As long as they're worth an hour and never change. So, now, uh, now, little ditty in case, you may not have a job when money always seems to lack, but you can still be useful. Work for Jonesy's Juiceless Jack. Now, why haven't they shot me yet if I'm such a threat to the bankster? power? Why'd they let me publish my lets? Why'd they let me into the United Nations? What's going on? Well, throughout all my political history, I've said I want to forgive and forget. ASA, global aspirin, amnesty for torturers and banksters too, security, everybody gets an interest-free time bank credit card, and anonymity, Rothschild, Rockefellers, Bushes, Warburg, change your names. Nobody wants to chase you no more. And let's get on with partying in heaven. Okay? So I want to party in heaven rather than go after the crooks from the past. And global amnesty, once the world is fixed, is easy. Right now, everybody can plead, I did it for the money, because everybody only had 10 and there were 11 owed. And if you didn't get it, you go under. So you may as well beat up and steal from the other guy to get his. You were forced to do it by the death gamble command. But once that's gone, no more reason to be like that. New world. So that's why I can say I can promise that if they let me be prime minister of the planet for a day so I can upgrade the bank software to one over S interest free, that I'm not going to let anybody shoot the bankers who set us free because they don't have to yet. So let us say a prayer that the bankers are going to set us free as long as we promise to let them live free with us. Okay, forgive and forget, party on in heaven. Johnny Engineer Termel.